Hello, this is your host, Cheryl C. Jones, with a warning. This podcast contains true stories of individual genius that may inspire you to take action in your own life. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, and welcome to Getting the Best Results podcast, where each week we talk about shortcuts or techniques that will help you get the best results in life and business. It's all about learning a new method or approach, or possibly an insight or an idea that will contribute to your life in a positive way. I'm your host, Cheryl Jones. I'm an author, facilitator, and professional speaker. My focus is on helping individuals and small businesses break through their common thinking to create bigger, bolder, better results. You can find me at simplythebestresults.com, where you'll also find lots of resources to help you break through. Now let's get on with this week's show. This week we have Jim Comer. Jim Comer is the on-stage strategist. Whether you're looking for a one-on-one speech coach, communication skills workshops, or help writing or polishing a presentation, Jim can help you become a confident, authentic communicator. He has worked with CEOs of Fortune 500 companies and coached hundreds of executives, entrepreneurs, and salespeople in more than 20 states. He's taught them all to give powerful presentations. Please help me welcome Jim Comer. Yay! Welcome, Jim. Hey, <laughs> Cheryl, I love that introduction. It makes me sound so wonderful. My mother. Well, you are. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you know, I need to. I, I want people when they hear this to know that did not happen easily or quickly. I mean, I went through many iterations along the way. You know, after I'm college. Sure. You know, you mean, I, I, I majored in political science in college because that's the major for people who don't know what they want to do. And so I did that, and uh, it was during the Vietnam War. So I went and taught school in Los Angeles in a gigantic mixed-race junior high school for my first job. I did it for two years, and I was really pretty good at it. I liked it. But there was this part of me that wanted to be rich and famous and have all that excitement. So what did I do? Gave up the good job, went to New York to become an actor along with about 100,000 other people. <laughs> and I think at any, any one time, there's maybe 1,500 actors working in the country for money. So the odds were not good. But anyway, I, I did that for seven years. I did a lot of writing on the side and kind of got good at that. And ultimately, I decided I wanted to eat. So I um, stopped acting, and I was lucky enough to get I, I get a job based on my writing because I'd had some stuff published and uh, – I'd written jokes for comedians, wow. and I'd written a book, and so I used that, and I got a corporate job uh, at Avon Products that changed my life, and that led into lots of good things, and then from there, the, the guy became a speech coach uh, because I worked with some of the executives there, and then eventually, I, I went out on my own full-time as a coach, presentation skills leader, and, uh, and then that led into speaking because I was coaching people in speaking, and so mm-hmm. I began to do speeches of my own, and uh, it, that's how I got to where I am right now. That's amazing. Whatever wow. that is. What? <laughs> it's all, it's, we're all on a journey, right? It's not about a destination. So your if journey has been my, my really kids, interesting. If anybody, if anybody had told me during my college years that this would be my career course, I would have said, no way. But there you go. <laughs> it was. You know, I've, I'm the same way. I got a C minus in, in speech in college, and I uh, just thought, and to, to think I'm doing that kind of thing now is just I'm mind boggling. It doesn't even seem possible now. I was never an actor, but um, yes, but that's okay. We'll stick with what we know. Right. And absolutely. then again, it's not too late, right? It's not too late. No. No. <laughs> wow. But what a, what a career you've had. That is amazing. So I'm curious because when we have, when people have such dynamic careers, there is usually a skill or a characteristic that's helped them be successful at it, like to get the best results, you know. And I'm curious, is there one or two skills or characteristics that you feel have been instrumental in your success? You know, that's a really good question, and uh, I've been thinking about it. I think the two that come to mind first, the most important one might be empathy, because I really understand that when people are going to give a speech, even if they're a CEO of a billion-dollar company 
or just somebody starting out in some other kind of small job, if they're speaking, they're scared, they're nervous, they're not sure what they do. You know, they don't know exactly what it is to be a good speaker. And so I really empathize with that fear and let them know that I have been there too. Because I think if they know that the teacher really gets it, the coach gets it, then they feel Mm. much more relaxed. And when I do workshops, I often talk about my first acting class in New York because I went there and I had very little background in acting, a couple of courses, but really hadn't been an actor. And I get into this high-powered New York acting class taught by a great teacher named David LeGrant, and Bernadette Peters was in my class. It was that Oh, my. Yeah, Bernadette was in the class. That's right. I love her. I'm telling you, I was Mm -hmm. so terrified of that class. And I mean, they were all better than me. And I didn't, I just didn't know what I was doing. And we had these crazy exercises we had to do. And I never understood them, at least not the first year. (laughs) And I would literally, when it was time to do an exercise, I would scrunch down behind the chair in front of me, hoping that he wouldn't call on me seriously. And of course, he saw that. (laughs) And eventually, I got called up to do what they could. There was this exercise called Song and Dance. It comes from the Actors Studio, that famous group. And and, Mm -hmm. and you'd stand in front of the group, and he would give you, you could pick any song, like Happy Birthday, and you'd have to do Uh it syllable by syllable, extending the syllables while looking at the rest of the class, which, of course, terrified me, and (laughs) trying to relax your face. And just keep eye contact and be natural. Well, <laughs> I thought I was supposed to do it perfectly, you know, give a performance. And I, mm-hmm. I, I started sweating and shaking. It was horrible. I mean, I'm going, happy <gasps> birth. You know, really, I'm trying to oh. look while doing that stupid stuff. I'm trying to be relaxed and look at the class. I'm telling you. It's maybe one of the worst experiences of my life. I was trying to do it perfectly when all he wanted me to do was make the effort, strengthen Uh, my will, do what the teacher mm. or therefore later the director would want me to do. That's what I learned after about six months to to, to, to 12 months of of agony. I finally got it. But boy, I I take that experience. I tell the classes about it. And I, I, I acted out. And they see, oh, wow, the teacher has been there too. The coach mm-hmm. understands. And if they know that I know, it just makes it a lot easier. They can connect with it me. Does. I want them to know that I've been in their they, shoes. So, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, you said there were two. Empathy. So it's yeah. The second one, of course, is understanding, uh, my, their yeah, my, fear. understanding their fear and understanding where they're coming from, no matter what their background is. And the other one, of course, is enthusiasm. I mean, I'm, I'm a lively speech coach and presentation skills leader. I'm, I, uh, when people do something well, I mean, I don't hold back. We celebrate every single victory along the way, whatever it is. It, it could be either big or small. If they're making progress, I want them to instantly know it. I want to celebrate it and get excited about it so they feel good about it and they're more likely to do it the next time. If they can really see it and feel it, and if I can celebrate it with them, and sometimes that's big. I mean, sometimes somebody makes a major breakthrough. I am jumping around and yelling and telling them, isn't that great? Um, I mean, I go, I go all out. And we have fun with it, and we celebrate it. And I, I don't, I don't hold back. I don't try to be the, you know, the regular normal teacher. I get excited, and the same thing comes as the as the workshop goes on. If they get to know me and trust me, then I can be when they do something that's not there yet. If I'm trying to get somebody to to raise their volume and they just can't do it, you know, they just still speaking in this little voice that says, "I'm scared." I'll say something like, "I will give you ten." thousand dollars if you will speak 30 percent higher or 50 percent ten thousand i'm going i'm going to go all out and sometimes that works <laughs> that really works for ten thousand dollars which of course they're not getting but for ten thousand dollars i'm saying how much louder could you think and they do exactly. get louder. they almost always get louder and we celebrate that and i say did you feel the difference did you get it oh great you know i mean i want them to know when they've achieved it so they can repeat it and so wow, when they see me celebrating them, it's, it's, it's authentic on my part. They're seeing me hmm. be in the class what I'm telling them to be, which is authentic 
and real and human. So when I'm acting that way, and it's not acting, when I'm just being that way, they get it. They get it by me practicing what I preach. You know, and another thing that happens always in workshops, I, I've got these glasses, which I mostly need for reading, but I have them on, and when I'm doing the class, I will get excited about something. I'll put my glasses down on the chair or, or the table, wherever I am, and then I go off and do whatever I'm doing, and I get involved in the class, and it's over. Then I, I'm saying, oh, where are my glasses? And of course, this happens all over for eight hours during the thing, and I usually appoint a person to be in charge of my glasses. <laughs> and I'm serious. Therefore, then he'll hand me the glasses, and uh, we can go on with the class. But again, that is a that is a real need of mine. That really happens. I get excited. I put the glasses down. But again, you totally forget them. Well, I just put them down. Yeah. I get so in the moment. I'm so in that zone in the moment. And what happens is that the not only do I get my glasses back, but the class yet again sees me being real and mm-hmm. authentic and not acting like a teacher. Not acting formal, but being a human being. And I, yes. that is what more than anything I want them to be. My whole goal for the class is what I call individuality leading to likability. Because when we Ooh. bring our true, individual, real, authentic selves, that person that's no one in the world is like that person, we bring that person to the audience. Don't take away from it, but really bring that person, that full, rich person. Then... They can have something to connect with. When you bring your authentic self, they get a real connection. But if you're hiding your real self, they never know who you are. They get a fraction well, Jim, of who you are. Oh, absolutely. And, but don't you think everybody knows how to communicate? I mean, like we all talk to one another, you know. Yeah, but, you go, yeah we're aren't, fine. Aren't we, aren't we being authentic, though? Do sure, you, we are do when we're think? not on stage, when we're not in front of a group. Oh. You take, you know, everybody knows how to communicate, especially with their friends and loved ones and maybe even their colleagues. They know how to compete. Most people do a pretty good job of communicating then. But the problem mm-hmm. is as soon as you bring an audience in, it could be five or ten people in a, in a team meeting at, at work, or it could be, you know, teaching a Sunday school class or being president of an organization or having to make a report on something at work, or anything like that. Or if, you, even if you're a major executive, getting up in front of an a, a industry group or a professional organization, then, of course, the stakes get higher. And that mm, famous definitely. F word comes in. The F word, not the one you're thinking. Which, no, no, not that one. The other one. <laughs> Fake. Fear. Fear. fear oh, oh, that word. <laughs> That the re- the real F word, the one that does so much damage to everybody. The minute oh, yeah. we have an audience almost of any kind, anywhere, these wonderful, natural, real, authentic communicators tend to disappear. And in their mm. place becomes somebody who's scared and nervous, kind of like me in the acting class, and somebody who's trying to, to do it right, to not make a mistake, to be perfect. Oh. And, of course, tough. we're never perfect. And but when we're trying to be perfect and not make a mistake, we make the ultimate mistake, not being ourselves. You know, being, mm. you know I, I usually ha- I, in, in the workshops I model someone who, who I, I say, look, here I am. You've just seen me for the last 30 minutes. You know, I've got smile, body language, da, da, da. you know, the, I'm, I'm moving around. I've got, I'm using my hands effectively. I'm smiling. I'm being real. Then I come. Then I go off, and I come back as a scared person, and everything that's been working is shut down. And I want them to oh. see the difference. And then, then they think about all the people they have seen present over the years, many of whom they know, and they remember the difference there. How people don't bring their full selves with them, and what I, audiences yes. are hungering for is the real, authentic, full person. Yes. And if we can overcome that fear, and the only way to overcome the fear is to do it get up and speak and get feedback and then take the feedback and use it the next time and the next time and the next time. Nobody gets better if they speak once or twice a year. And I know CEOs that try to keep it to a minimum. Well, they never get better. Mm-hmm. The only people that get that's... better is yeah, true of anything, I think, sports or I think they... singing. Absolutely. And I think people, those CEOs and others, don't feel comfortable to begin with. And so that's probably they want to keep that to a minimum. Those who are more comfortable are able to, you know, and less maybe self-concerned, uh, you know, worried about what people are going to think about them, 
can get up there and do and really be convincing uh, without trying. And that's that authentic self I think you're talking about. How, tell yeah, me yeah that's exactly right. Oh, well, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I think I my was whole... Gonna... <laughs> well, we both want to talk at the same time. Go ahead, Cheryl. What were you going to say? I was going to say, I want to know about, you know, because I want to, how you got so interested in this idea of authentic communication, because it, it when we talk about it from the, in the speaking world, um, typically we, we have people who have a message they want to communicate, and they're not really thinking about doing, I don't believe, they're thinking about doing it from an authentic point of view. They're thinking about, you know, the, the certain elements, and it has to have this and that and another, and they're not really thinking about speaking from what I think you're saying is speaking from their heart in their most, most authentic way. But what was it that got your attention? What brought you to focus on authentic communication? Well, you know, it all started with my very first corporate job. And I had been a teacher and then I'd been an actor for, for seven years and I'd never had a corporate job. And I finally quit quit acting and I, I was able, lucky enough to get this this gig at Avon Products, world headquarters in New York City, right off Fifth Avenue. And... Um, I, I was in a whole different world, but fortunately, my job was to, to write sales meetings for their 3,000 district managers, who then gave the meeting to their half a million Avon ladies every month. Wow. And it turns out that these district managers were the salt of the earth, middle Americans. They were my mother times 3,000. I mean, <laughs> I totally got them. And some of these New York writers did not know them that well, but I did. They were my people. So I – and I went to their meetings regularly, and I could write for them in an authentic, real manner that connected with their audience. And it was a great match. And I realized that simple, clear language with a little humor and some excitement in there that made all the difference. And, and it was real, I was really successful at doing that, and I enjoyed it. And then one day, I got a – a uh, special request to write a speech for the CEO who was going to be talking to many of my managers on a 12-city hookup. And I thought, oh, really? Okay, well, I can do this. And so I wrote the CEO, who I did not know except to see him in the distance. I wrote him this warm, personal, real, non-corporate speech for this big banquet that was going to be televised over the country. And they all loved it. All the people upstairs on the 35th floor where I never went loved my speech. And they had me come up, and they said, he's going to read it to about 20 people here in the, in the little office and see the practice thing, and we want you to be there. And I said, oh, great. Go to the thing, and he gets up, and this man, Mr. Casey, is terrible, unbelievably no. bad. I'm standing there going, oh, my God, he's going to ruin my speech. No, I, I, I was just devastated. And so, I mean, I don't know what possessed me to do this because I, I mean, I say I barely knew the man. Really, I did. And he knew what I'd written the speech, but that was about it. I go up to him after he's done this, and I say, I'm thinking that this might get me fired, but I'm going to say it anyway. I say, Mr. Casey, uh, you know, I thought you did a good job, but I really think you can be even better if we could rehearse a few times. Would you be interested in that? And I thought, well, there's my job going right now. There's this long <laughs> pause. And he's, I, I'm not curious. It was a long pause. And he said, you know, no one has ever asked me to rehearse. And I'm thinking to myself, well, God, I can sure see why. Uh, and then <laughs> he said, I think it's a good idea. And so we rehearsed, I don't know, three or four times over the next couple of weeks. And he got better. He really got better. Oh. He didn't get great, but he got measurably, observably better and everybody loved what he did when the big night came and suddenly i am a speech writer and a speech coach and everybody's treating me so differently than they're treating me before oh. i'm liking it and they had this big uh, big conference coming up about six weeks later where they're going to bring all three thousand uh, managers together my people and um, all the all the big executives wanted me to help them with their speech and, and rehearsing it and it changed my life Wow. wow. And, the, and the funny thing, at, at that conference, which is the only time in the history of the company before or since that they've ever brought all the district managers together, 
They invited Bob Hope, who was the most famous comedian of the 19th, 18th, of the 18th century, 20th century, I think is what I'm trying to say. No, Bob didn't go back to the 19th or 18th. <laughs> but he lived so long. He lived to be 100. I don't know, I just wanted to. He could have gone back to the century. <laughs> he could have. Yeah, he could have. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, he was, he was a star of just amazing uh, you know, resilience. And the, everybody was thrilled to have him. They had a black tie event for him. And I knew that he liked to do jokes about his audience, his real audience. And I'd read that a bunch of times. And so I, I got up in the middle of the night one night, I wrote him a monologue based on the real problems and issues and hot buttons of these 3000 managers. Cause I knew, the, oh, I knew what upset it. Yeah. I wrote this, I wrote this monologue and, um, I went down to the conference where I was coaching people, and I went to the. I went got there before he came for his dress rehearsal, and I had them put my monologue on the teleprompter. He shows up, and I introduce myself, tell him about the monologue I wrote for him, and he says, "Well, I'd like to see that." And then he saw it, and he did not get one joke because they were such in jokes. See, you had to really oh, be an yeah. he, And But he was so nice. Bob Hope was the kindest person to me. He said, come back to my hotel. Let's sit down. Go over the jokes and, and tell me why they're funny. So I'm telling Bob Hope <laughs> what's funny. So I'm not kidding. It was just amazing. It was like a surrealistic moment. And, oh, um, that's so cool. So I sat down with him. We went over the jokes again. I explained to him why they're funny. The end, he still didn't get it. And so he said oh. he was very kind. He said, okay, Jim, I will do one joke. You get them all on the telephone. I'll do one joke. You pick the best one. And if it gets a laugh, I'll do all of them. I went, okay. <gasps> I said, do the first one I've got because it's the thing they're most upset about, the company car. And at night, comes out the tuxedo. I'm in my tuxedo. I'm holding my breath. None of the executives know that this is happening. They're sitting oh, down there. They have no, oh, no, they have no idea. We, the head of conferences and I did this as a surprise. And, um, he gets out. He tells that joke about the company car, and they screamed and yelled and beat the floor. The, uh, I, it was unbelievable. And the <laughs> look on his face, Bob couldn't believe that this joke he didn't understand was getting this laugh. And he proceeded oh. to do the whole monologue, and it just it worked. It was one of the happiest five minutes moments of my life. I mean, it was just <laughs> magical. And I'm thinking to myself, well, he's going to definitely want to take me with him back to California and make me on his writing staff, surely. Well, Surely. I never saw no. him again. <laughs> but I've got to tell you, that monologue was the biggest moment of the three-day conference. The managers talked more about that. And the reason was, you see, not only did it get, give them a laugh, it told them subliminally, Bob Hope knows who I am. He oh. understands me and my problems. Bob Hope knows me. Well, that's, wow. that's what the monologue was designed to do. It wasn't true, but the illusion was true. Sure. And they left with that, and it made them feel so good. And um, that, anyway, that was just, that a, it yeah. was just one of those wow. great moments. It was a great, great month, night, yeah. Oh, wow. That's fabulous. I uh, wish I could have been there. I'm not an Avon person, well, but it, I mean, you know. It really, it really was. It was great. And, and uh yeah, it, it was. That's it was, great. It, the, the executives didn't even know what to do. They had to embrace it. <laughs> the good news was they were replacing the company car the next morning, and I knew that. So that's why I was able to kid about it because it was going to be changed the next morning, and that made the oh, uh, the uh, district managers very happy. Wow, that's well, that's that's cool. That's very cool. <laughs> so you actually kind of supported the the CEO in the process of change kind of thing. That's oh, yeah. Really, oh, yeah. I knew that the with, car was With humor. Fixed. I would have been nervous about yeah. making that joke if I hadn't known it was going to be fixed. But, um, yeah. you know, I, I talked about the stuff that was real for them because mm -hmm. I knew all those things because I worked with them. So I knew what they were upset about. Yeah. And that's and what I think makes, that's, it, I think makes it connect. And I think every company can do that when we can kid ourselves as a person or as a company or a nonprofit or a school, whatever the organization is, we need to be able to kid ourselves. Audiences love that, and they will mm -hmm. forgive you for so much if you're real. They, they yeah. want, they hunger for real. I think one of the reasons right now that uh, Governor Cuomo in New York is doing such a great job in his briefings on the virus and, and the response to it, he's been giving daily mm -hmm. briefings for about three weeks now, and uh, he is calm, he's concise. He's fact-based, and he uses great personal 
uh, warmth and charm. And that's New York charm, but it's charm and even humor. And this is a guy who had been um, kind of famous as being a real tough, some people said arrogant, effective, but, but not Mr. Warm. Well, he, he found those parts of his personality, and he has brought them into this uh, daily briefing. And it has been extremely effective. And when you finish with the briefing, it kind of makes you feel better. So oh, that's, I mean, great. that's a perfect example yeah. of someone using their full personality, compassion and caring and humor, as well as really bringing facts and important information. And the marriage mm-hmm. of those two uh, is really good. And, you know, his brother has the virus right now, and he's a CNN oh. uh, anchor. So they've done a number of, uh, of, of sessions where the two of them are on screen together, and they kid each other. But, again, the fact that his brother has the virus – and is struggling with it, makes it even more powerful. He's able to, again, use real things to get his point across. Mm -hmm. And that's what I urge everybody to do. You've done a fabulous job of role-playing that during this conversation because you have told such rich stories that have just kind of drawn me in, and I know it will draw our listeners in as well, to want to know more, and and I know that you storytelling is like, well, you've just made it look so easy in the last couple of stories you told, but I know storytelling is a big part of what you talk about in terms of communicating authentically. Is there anything else you want to maybe tell us about that in terms of how to maybe how to use stories to connect in a in a real heart centered kind of way? I I think stories work in, in almost. In almost any presentation, you can find a way, even if it's a little mini story, to, to bring that in. Things that are just totally fact, 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 that's, that's hard to, to absorb all that. It, it, it needs some humanizing in there. So I don't think mm. it matters what kind of presentation it is. If you can bring an example, a before and after, or in a story of any kind to em- emphasize your points, because the truth of it is, when, it, when two or three weeks go by, they're not going to remember much of what you said. I hate to bring mm. this to most people. This is a, a really news for a lot of people, especially those people who are tempted to do 70 slides or something like that, or even 50. And they think mm-hmm. because they put a bullet point up that we're going to remember it. Well, I try to get them to understand that audiences really can't remember much. If you are smart – you're going to limit the number of major points to two or three at the most. And then if they remember one or two of your two or three major points, you've done your job. If they remember them and they have a positive feeling about you, because more than anything else, audiences are going to leave with a feeling about the speaker. They're going to either like them, Uh. which is what we want, or they're going to feel blah about them. They have nothing, no feeling at all. Or they're going to dislike them. That's the one of three things that's going to happen. Dislike, blah, or like. Well, of course, our goal is for like. Our goal is for like and a couple of points. If they leave thinking, oh, that Cheryl is just terrific. Let's write down her name. Yeah, I remember her. She's great. If that's all they get from your presentation, Cheryl, home run. They like you. Good point. Maybe yeah. And then if they remember your number one point and like you, that's home run with somebody, you know, with maybe one run mm-hmm. scoring. And if they like you and you, they remember two of your major points, that's as good as it gets. That's a home run with the bases loaded. Wow. And stories, stories help you get those points remembered. Mm-hmm. The stuff that we were talking about earlier, the enthusiasm, the empathy, and using all your full personality, that will be the personal connection. But then you've got to limit your points to a few and make them the most important points and make sure you find ways to repeat them in- interestingly. And then you tell a story to lock in those two big points because they're much more likely to remember the point if you tell a story with it. And, you know, I, I heard Colin Powell, the famous general, former secretary of state, heard him speak, gosh, more than 25 years ago, maybe close to 30, at a giant speaking event in California. There was 10 or 12 major speakers. He was one of them. He was the biggest name of the all at the moment. He spoke for 30 minutes. I have absolutely no idea what he said. However. No kidding. No, not one. I don't have any idea what he said, except 
for one great story. I remember the story. Oh. And here's what he said. He said, you know, and it, it was a terrific story because it had a double whammy, kind of like what I did with Bob Hope. That's what this story mm-hmm. is. He said, you know, um, I love being retired. He had just retired about a couple of months earlier. I'm just loving my retirement. Finally, I get to take my wife to the movie on a Saturday night. And uh, he said, you know, just, a, just three or four weeks ago, we went to the local Cineplex and, you know, we saw the movie. We were headed back to our car in the parking lot. And this, and this woman came rushing up to me. She said, oh, General, General, you are my favorite person in the world. I love you so much. You are so terrific, General Schwarzkopf. Oh. She had the wrong <laughs> general. Well, she, that got a big laugh. And, I bet it did. But see, it's a big. But here's the deal. Here's the magic of it. The laughter was not why he told the story. He told it for the same reason I wrote those jokes for Bob Hope. He told it because those those audience members said to themselves, even if they didn't know what they were saying it, they said, "Gosh, Colin is a real nice guy. I mean, the same. Mm. He's a lot like me. The people forget mm-hmm. my name all the time. They forget who I was, or they don't notice me, or they get me mixed up. It happens to me too." Ah, he's just like me. We have the same problem. So they're leaving with this warm, personal connection with him. And that is the magic of the story. Because it is what locks in a good feeling about him. He got the laugh, but he also got this underlying connection. And that's what we want. That's what audiences want. Mm -hmm. And I've always wondered if that was a true story or if it was a speechwriter story. I don't know. I don't know, but it doesn't seem to matter. It sounds perfect. It sounds perfect. But here's the deal. It doesn't matter. He was smart enough to use it. Whether it was real or whether it was made up, it was was a perfect way for him to connect with that audience. And here I am remembering it more than 25 years later. Mm -hmm. And I do not remember one other word he said. Isn't that funny? So That is funny. That's because he was funny. Yeah. Yeah. Stories will connect with an audience, and if it's the right story, you lock in your point. Find a story that helps you make that point. It doesn't have to be a story about yourself, but if it's about yourself or your family or your dog or your whatever, that's even better yeah. because then they're going to have a feeling about you as well as your point. You know, and and I, here's the deal. Right now, listening to this podcast, there are a lot of people saying, oh, Jim, I don't have any stories. I'm not like Colin Powell. Nobody wants to hear my stories. And I am saying you could not be more wrong. Mm-hmm. You all have stories. Everybody listening to this has great stories. You just don't realize it. I'll bet you if you made a list going back to when you were a kid, family, brothers and sisters, whatever happened when you were a child, summer camp, high school, uh, baseball teams, athletics, uh, going to the army, going to college, roommates, fraternity, uh, first date, first love, last second losing the first love, uh, all the things, first job, first time you got fired, you know, all, all those kind of things. Man, you oh, just hit on a lot day. of stuff I had experiences around. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, gotta, and I, and I barely got list. into the work life. You know, I didn't even get into, you know, dealing right. with other people in the workplace, um, uh, making a mistake. You know, Audiences also mm-hmm. love it when the speaker will tell about a mistake uh, he made, something that, that, that he did that just didn't work, and he got in trouble, mm-hmm. and he either he got past it with his boss but, or he didn't. Maybe he got fired. Who knows? But the point is if you share your mistakes and what you learned from them and how you changed your behavior or your attitude because of that mistake – Audiences eat it up because you're teaching yeah. them uh, using your own life how they can make a mistake and get over it and get better because of it. And they're also, by doing that, you're having that, that, that subliminal connection with them. And you think, oh, that Jim is he's a pretty good guy. I, mean, I didn't know he'd gone through that. And <laughs> God, it must have been terrible to have gotten fired on Christmas Eve. Oh, the poor guy. But he got, well, here he is. He's, he made it. He survived. You see, he survived. So back to this. Yeah, and so audiences love it when we when we're real and and, and we tell stories about our. They much rather hear about your your um, failures than your successes because I mean, we, yes. we, successes are easy, but uh, to talk about but but failures and what you learned about it, boy, those are really powerful. 
They are. Well, it's funny. Me, I've, I've always said to a. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, Cheryl. Yep. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, you know, I find, when I tell people they've got stories, I've often, I've, I've often said, you know, if you have been to Antarctica and you haven't told any audience about it, you are nuts. Because we are all, we'd love to know what's in Antarctica. Nobody goes there. Point zero 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 one percent of the world's population has gone to Antarctica. So talk about it if you've been there. Well, last August, as I said that in front of 30 people, this one hand went into the air. I said, yes. He said, I spent six months in Antarctica. <laughs> and I said, oh my get gosh. up here right now. <laughs> so I oh, that's hysterical. Class. I had him talk to the class about Antarctica for the next 10 minutes. Of course, I mean, he proved my point, and he had, us, he had our attention. That's wonderful. So you wonderful. never know how your story it was, because it, it was so funny. I, I'd used that, that line for years, and all of a sudden, here was somebody who was living what I just talked about. So we used it. It's fabulous. Fabulous. Well, thank you for sharing all this with us. This has just been amazing, and the, just the depth and breadth and just – I've gotten, I'm taking notes over here because there's so many good things that are coming out of it. I'm like, oh, I could use that and I could learn from that and so forth. Tell me, what's next for you? What are you focusing on today as, as you think about the future? And I know we're in the middle of this pandemic and really the way the business is usual is not usual anymore. So what, what's next for you? What are you focusing on and so forth? Well, what I'm focusing on, but I think a lot of people are right now, I am learning to use Zoom, and especially that, that seems to be the, uh, the the platform of choice right now. And I have had, I, I think last week I had seven different meetings on Zoom, had one yesterday. And uh, so I think it's real important to learn this new way of communicating effectively. I have bought a new camera, so I've now got a camera for my, uh, sitting on the top of my desktop. Yesterday, my new lighting, ring lighting, arrived and got that assembled so at least i'm better lit when i have you know when i'm on <laughs> zoom i'm getting a, a i think it's a yeti i think that is my, my uh, microphone and um i'm trying to get my you know my home office set up so i'm effective that way i've changed the backdrop and then i want to learn how i can host a zoom meeting mostly i've been going to other people's but right now that is a real talent if you if you're able to be effective on zoom you can keep up with all sorts of groups and individuals, and it's a wonderful way to communicate right now. So I think that's important to, to realize this is going to be a lot of the future, and being good on video is more important than ever because I believe we will come out of this, and I believe we will come out of it, but I think we're going to come out of this with a lot of major changes, especially in the mm -hmm. meetings industry as speakers, as presenters, and I think that uh, the online world is going to be with us uh, in a much larger uh, way in the future because I think we're getting so used to it that it's not going to go away. People are going to be doing a lot more on Zoom for the, for the future, and so being good on video is essential. And the other thing I would say is this is a great time to do some writing. And again, I'm mm. practicing what I preach. I'm writing my, I'm working on my memoirs right now. And uh, I'm in high school at the moment. <laughs> and so I'm in fertile ground. And so I think if you have a writing project that you've been saying to yourself that you want to do, this is the time to do it. So this gift of time that we've got yes. right now, a really gift of time. If you've ever been saying you wanted to write, now is the time. Mm -hmm. If ever there was, and you can... Absolutely. Well, and all the things that you've talked about, about storytelling and authentic voice and communication, also applies to writing, also applies to video. It's, it's a little bit different because sometimes the only body language you can see on video is from, you know, sometimes it's the neck up, but, but it, you know, yeah, it, yeah, it but is you can do it. the back of the camera up. <laughs> well, you can do that, and you can also... Um... You can use your hands. Uh, they can certainly mm -hmm. see. They see all the facial expressions. They see how well you work. Your eye contact is with the camera. And it's good to have it on a level okay. so that you are level with the, the camera. I've been told. So your yes. eye contact, your smile, your your the, the vocal variety, how you go up and down with your voice, which comes natural to some of us, but not to everybody. And then you can mm -hmm. move back enough so they can at least see your top of your body and your hands. 
And the only thing you really can't do if you're sitting at a desk is body language, but you can also configure your camera so that you're four or five you know, feet back. And we heard, Cheryl, you and I heard this past weekend, one of our, our peers in the uh, National Speakers Association here in Austin, uh, Courtney, um, mm-hmm. Courtney told us uh, how she gave a keynote to a client on Zoom. Amazing. And she, yeah. she had her home studio fixed up, and she, her husband, who's really good at this, works with her, and they were able to, to do a real all-out keynote on Zoom. And so she was giving us the tips on how to do that. So you can do almost anything with it. That's, I know. It's awesome. And, and your skills apply to everything. I, I think it's fabulous. So um, well, two, uh, two wants- weeks ago – yeah. Oh, excuse me. Go. Two weeks ago, uh, I was I was supposed to teach a class that I was doing as a volunteer to a high school here, where they have a business class where they're doing some entrepreneurial things, and they wanted help on presentation skills. So I'd done it a year ago, and we had a lot of fun. So they asked me back for this year, but of course the schools are closed. So I said, why don't we try it on Zoom? And we had 50 kids from three different classes come in, and they were all over my screen. I had an hour of presentation <laughs> skills with them, and I, was, and I told them, I said, look, guys, I talk a lot about being nervous and fear. Well, I'm nervous about this because I have never done this before. 50 people, class for an hour, this is brand new to me. And so I, I was real upfront about that. But as it went on, we all got comfortable with it, and I was able to, able to get some people to do exercises with me. One of the things I do most is to tell me the best or worst experience of your professional career. That's one of my exercises. So for them, I said, the best or worst experience of high school. And I got three or four uh, of them talking. And, we, and, and they were kind of general statements at first. I mean, I would go into that one person. I'd get their screen bigger. And we'd really go back and forth. And I would get them to be specific. And it, as they drilled down from saying, oh, I love my friends and blah, blah, blah. But it wasn't exciting. I said, tell me about one friend and what you really like about the one friend. And then it got real, and they opened up. And the, it, and the whole class could see the change and, and, and get it in real time. They could see that person going from dull to, to interesting by being specific. Wow. It was and fun. I loved it. That's awesome. And they, yeah. And the good news was the teacher told me that not one person left the class that came in. They stayed awesome. all out. So I, I took that as a vote of confidence. That is a vote, especially from high schoolers. <laughs> Brian, I think if you can keep 17-year-olds, you can keep anybody. Absolutely. Well, in conclusion, I want to let our audience know that you work with people one-on-one as well as in groups. And That's right. And that if, if, they need, if, or if they need or want, they, most of us do need, so, um, you know, some help with communication skills or some one-on-one speech coaching or help polishing a presentation, whether it's um, a CEO or, a, you know, anyone, um, college student, high school student, whatever it may be, in be, anything in between, anytime we want to make a good impression, guys, Jim is the guy to talk to because he knows how to help you engage an audience. So, Jim, that being said, how can, how can our audience reach you? What would you like well, them to easiest, do? I would love them to just send me an email. That's easy. They can either send me an email at jim at Comer Communications with an S, all one word, C-O-M-E-R communications.com, or you can call me. My, uh, my number is 512 512- Nine four nine nine two eight one. As they do in the commercials, let me say that again: five one two nine four nine nine two seven one. So there you go. I would love to talk to you. And the, one of the most important things I do is uh, help people write the speech as well as deliver it, because so often. People come with not well-written speeches and they want to give them, so we have to go back and do a rewrite on the speech. Mm. So it's the content and the delivery have to be equally good. You can't have one without the other. So that's what I love to do, yeah. Yep, makes a lot of sense. Terrific. Well, I want to thank you again for being our guest today. I just feel like you've enriched my life, and I'm sure that this this will enrich other people's lives. And so thank you so much for being here. And I want to thank our listeners for joining us today. Um, it, we will have more wonderful stuff coming in the future, and please keep checking back for updates and other podcasts on different subjects along the way. But today we've had Jim Comer, and it's been an absolute pleasure to be with you, Jim. Thank you so much much for being here. Well, I loved, 
I loved it, and it was just fun fun talking to you. We were able to have the same kind of conversation on the podcast that we do after NSA meetings. <laughs> that's right. We right? sure do. The same just a little of, longer this same, time. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's really fun. I loved it. Thanks so much. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. We appreciate you joining us, and we'll see you next time. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a five-star rating and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. To connect with me, Cheryl C. Jones, you can find me on LinkedIn and Facebook by my name. Don't forget that Cheryl is spelled with a C-H and be sure to include my middle initial, the letter C. You're welcome to email me at Cheryl at simplythebestresults.com or visit my website of www.cheryl.com simplythebestresults.com for more information and inspiration. This has been a GSTBR production created and hosted by me, Cheryl C. Jones, edited by Brandy Hockaday and produced by Kathy Holscher. New episodes are available each Thursday on Apple, Stitcher, Spreaker, Google, and many other podcast directories. Thanks for joining us this week and we'll see you next week. Thank you.